So I've been doing some work with CPM recently. This is Digital Researchers operating system from the 70s and 80s for the 8080 and Z80 processors. It's an absolute masterpiece of minimalism, but it's so old that it predates proper licensing and as a result most of the software is encumbered and can't really be used today. Now I have been slowly trying to put together a properly open source clone of CPM and I found most of the pieces. One of the pieces which is missing is the assembler which was used to write programs for CPM. It would assemble 8080 machine code into binaries and you got a copy of the assembler with the operating system distribution which meant that when you got CPM you got all the tools you needed to write programs. Now what you're looking at here is a copy of the original 1980 source for the CPM command shell and today I'm going to try and write an assembler that will assemble this from scratch. So this is all based on the 8080 which is backwards compatible with the Z80 processor. The 8080 is a very simple processor, much simpler than the Z80, which actually kind of helps. This means that writing an assembler for it isn't actually too bad. So let's start with a bit of boilerplate. I'm writing this in C. using uh, the SDCC compiler for reasons of simplicity. The original assembler was in handwritten machine code. I actually have a copy of the source here. So, uh, yeah. There we go, we have a binary. It's all of 34 bytes. And we have an emulator that will actually let me run this. And it does nothing. Now, CPM is incredibly simple and it doesn't really have any C bindings, so I've actually made my own. Each of these files calls a CPM system call so that for example, to you know, open a file, you set up the appropriate thing and call this, and it makes it happen. And you notice that the main function here neither takes nor returns any parameters. This is because input and output to the program are actually parsed for you by the CPM command shell. So the very first thing we need to do when the program starts is to actually look at the file that's passed in on the command line. Actually, before I do that, I have a copy of the original uh, digital research assembler here, which is all of 8K. So let's actually run this and assemble our program. So we run the emulator, we run the digital research assembler and we give it the ccp to asm source file. And that does not work. Why doesn't that work? Okay, that works. Oh, yes. I keep forgetting this. The, the interface to the program is kind of weird. So the file name is parsed and sent to the program but the actual assembler, uh, it uses the three letters of the file extension as drive letters for where to put its various files. So what this has actually done was it's tried to, I think, write the output to drive M, which is stupid. But we're going to have to do that because it's part of the public interface. So anyway, that assembled our CCP to ASM. This and it has emitted a hex file. Let's spell it correctly, which is this, which contains the assembled command shell. This 
is Intel Hex Records, which is an incredibly inefficient way of storing machine code, but that's got, you know, Vim has nicely highlighted everything for you. This column is the length, this column is the address, this column is the type of record, zero, 00 means byte. Then we have some data, then we have some checksum. So this means write these 16 bytes of data to address zero. And you go through the rest of the thing to the end. All these control Z's at the bottom are because CPM does not actually know how long files are. So this is padding out to the length of the current block on disk. When the when a tool sees a control Z in the input stream, it knows to stop. Okay, so now the the assembler reads in a source file and it outputs a hex file and the listing. You've just seen the listing. This so you've just seen the hex file. This is the listing which is a copy of the source code with the uh, annotated with what it actually emitted. And our assembler is going to emit a listing file, but it's not going to be like this. Uh, it's going to be drastically simplified. So let's, let's find my file again, right. So, on entry to the program, the CPM FCB file structure here has been populated with the source file. The FCB is CPM's equivalent of a file descriptor. It contains all the information needed to refer to the file on the disk, and all the state needed to refer to a file being used. So. Uh, Let me oops. let me just copy a few helpful helpful things from a different program. Yes, I have no standard library. Uh, SDCC will provide printf, but I don't actually want to use it. The reason for this is that it's gigantic. So, uh, yeah, let's just keep these. What we've got here are a few helpful tools for just printing stuff to uh, to the output stream. So. So what this will do was it will just output the file name that we give it, or not. I had put char as in studio. There we go. So you can see that we gave it the CCP file name, and it has written out the name of the file. Uh, the CPM shell has uppercased everything for us. So we are going to use that as our input stream FCB. We also need to define a couple of FCBs for the output files. So that would be start FCB. FCB. So copy the FCB to the new locations. So 
set the file extensions appropriately. Actually, before we do that, we need to copy the drive letters. Which are in the ninth, tenth, and eleventh characters. Uh, I believe it's like that. We've got the the manual here from 1970 something. So here we are the command. Uh, ASM ABX source file to pick in disk A, hex file on B, and the listing file to X, which is the console, and Z skips. Okay, so source file is the first letter hex file is the second letter. Okay, so we've got that right. Uh, now we want to set, we want to also, also want to set the file extensions correctly. Set we want mem copy. Destination source size. So remember that we need to set the drive letter and extension of the source. Okay, let's try that. a underscore F not a structure union member So STCC is a bit buggy. I'm reasonably sure that unless I'm doing something really stupid, this should be working.
that nine was wrong for a start. Yeah, look at the wrong line numbers. Yeah, this always gets me with SDC. My eye homes in on the error number here, which looks like a line number, but it's not. Line 36, underscore F. Yeah, let's try that. Let's try that. Underscore F is not the structure. Okay, so I think that's a red herring. FCB is definitely a pointer. Ah, it's not a struct, it's a... Yeah. It's a type deft. Yeah, I should know that because I like wrote all this code. Well, that was embarrassing. Much better. Line 42, cannot assign values to aggregates. Right, that is a um, STCC bug because you're supposed to be able to do that. Let's just use memcopy instead. Nearly there, line 50. Array or point, yep. Right, okay. So that, I tell it I want to assemble CCP and it, is so, it produces these three files. Now there is one other thing we want to do, which is in this situation, I haven't actually specified a drive letter. Let's actually print the drive letter. Let me first remind myself what the drive letter looks like. Find the FCB definition. Sometimes drives are referred to by letter, sometimes they are referred to by a, uh, here we go. Right, one is drive A, zero is default. So, Okay, that looks very wrong. Yes, I have screwed that up. Nine, ten, eight. Right. Backtick is not a valid drive letter. This is because the file name I'm giving it here, which is just CCP, the extension is supplied as CCP dot space space space, and space is not a valid drive letter. So the drive letters here actually need to be uh,
you need to convert from uh, the drive letter to um, an actual drive code. And we do this. The drive letter can be space if it is invalid. At this point, we want to at this point is correct that corresponds to drive code 0 which means use default drive for file now the other uh, the other codes the other special codes were x y z etc those will be like standard drives all right so we are now correctly parsing the files we now wish to open the output hex and printer files. Now we only want to do this if the drive letter is an actual drive. So again, this is not a drive letter. This is the drive code. So 16 is the top drive. So if it's not valid, just do nothing. Now, otherwise, yeah, I don't have auto completion here. Otherwise, we wish to delete any existing file and create a new file. Now, I don't actually remember whether my emulator supports delete. It does. Right. So that has truncated the hex and print hex and print files, which is correct. And they should now be ready for reading. Let me just double check the make system call. Create file. Uh, creates the file. It should also initialize the FCB so that we can write to it. That is code 22. Uh, I am not convinced this document, here we go, make file. Make file operation is similar to the open file operation, except the FCB names a file that does not exist. Okay, that will then create the file. It is now ready to write to, which is great. Let me just see how big my program is so far. 340 bytes. Uh, yeah. A lot of that will be the boilerplate here. Okay, we have now opened our output files. We now need to start reading the input. Quick 
quick pause for a drink. Now, the 8080 is a pretty simple architecture. It doesn't have any variable length instructions. For example, the Z80 has instructions that can take either one or two bytes, depending on what you're doing. For example, the various branch instructions. That's actually not entirely true. Anyway, the 8080 is really dead simple. Every single opcode has either a has has a parameter based on the. Uh, let me rephrase. You can tell how big the parameters are from what the opcode is. So LXI always takes a two byte parameter. And this is different from that. That is the load 16 bit instruction. This is different from MVI, which takes an eight bit parameter. Now the Z80 uses the LD instruction for both of these. And it determines whether you're loading in a 16 bit value into BC or an eight bit value into B from what register you load. The 8080 doesn't do that. It uses different instructions for each. This makes it really simple to assemble for. We need a two pass assembler where the first pass reads all the source and figures out where all the labels are. And the second pass actually emits the code. So we need to know what pass we're in. So we're going to go two passes. Oh yeah, um, I also completely forgot. Error handling, yay. CPM's error handling is very, very straightforward. It usually just returns either a pass fail code or just aborts your program and returns it directly to the uh, the console. So we did do some error handling in a uh, I did I did do some error handling in another program. I think that was dump so C. Uh, dumps even simpler. Uh, where is it? This on the left is a copy of the stat program which I wrote in C to replace the digital digital research one. It's a surprisingly complicated and amazingly badly designed program. Okay. Yeah, it looks like I didn't do any error handling there, probably because the underlying program didn't. Now, I happen to have a copy of the original assembler source code here. So let's just have a quick look and see what it does. Uh, written all in machine code. So, search for make, make a file. Uh, yeah, so this, okay, that's straightforward enough. This is the original equivalent of the CPM makefile function. What it does is you give it an FCB in the DE registers, which I'm doing here. Uh, it calls the CPM system call to actually create the file, checks for an error, if there's no error, it continues. If there is an error, it reports the appropriate error message and um, terminates. Now, we only want to check for an error on a CPA make file. So we do if, if we could not create a file, then What is the error it's actually producing? Error mar. No directory space. Yeah, that was the file. That was the error we saw earlier when I used the wrong 
parameters. So we're going to do better than that. And output file. And what error is going to do is it just prints the message. And did I actually remember to put in a system call for exit program? I probably didn't, to be honest. Yeah, let's put this out on those. And then we terminate. Very, very simple. Okay. CPM exit. Exiting a CPM program can be done in two ways. You can either return back to the command shell if you haven't used the memory where the command shell lives, or you can restart the system, which is like very fast. If you have used the memory the command shell used, this then causes the system to reload the, uh, the command shell. And if you want to restart the system, you just jump to zero. So we do this. And that should have worked. Okay, back to our assembler. And now at the beginning of each pass, we wish to open the... So we need to read the input file twice, once for each pass. So what, what I'm going to do is actually open... We can either open it twice or we can open it once and rewind the file once we finished it. Let's rewind the file. We don't need a function for that. In SDCC, functions are actually quite expensive because all values are passed on the stack rather than in registers. Um, if you look at my CPM system core bindings, you see that each of these things has got this on it. This forces SDCC to pass a single parameter in a register, which makes the uh, code way smaller. So, at the beginning of each pass, we wish to rewind the file back to the beginning. And we do this by adjusting the, the, the FCB state directly. We want, we want to do that. That just resets the pointer back to the beginning again. So, we now wish to start reading bytes out of the input file. Now this is a little bit more exciting than it sounds because CPM does not actually have the ability to read bytes from a file. Instead what you do is you read complete 128 byte records one at a time out of files. This means that CPM doesn't have to care about file sizes, it just needs to care about allocated sectors. So we're actually going to need our own buffering scheme. So we want to read a byte from the input file. And we need a 128 byte buffer to do this. We actually already have one defined. You get one in CPM automatically. It's at uh, OX80. 
Um, I need to adjust my bindings for that actually. On entry to the program, this particular buffer also contains the command line, but we're not actually using that in this program. Okay. So to keep track of how much is left in our buffer so that we can reload the buffer from the file. Uh, okay. So when we read a byte from the file, if we have bytes remaining in the buffer, then uh, do we want to do it like that? Do we want to do it the other way around? So, This variable will now contain the number of bytes we have read out of the input buffer. And we initialize it to OX80 to indicate that we have read all the bytes and we need to read the next block from the file. So, Okay, if there is anything left in the buffer which we haven't read, just return it. Now, otherwise, we need to tell CPM that we want to do file access in the default DMA buffer, and then read the next block from the file. And if there is no additional data, hmm, hmm. Detecting the end of files is going to be interesting. Because I don't think we can distinguish between that and a read error. Right, okay, we don't actually have to. Uh, I've forgotten about this. CPM read errors are fatal and cause the program to exit. So all we need to do is says it returns zero if the read succeeded, uh, non-zero if it fails. So if the read fails, then just fill the fill the buffer with end of file characters. 
Okay, let's see, refactor this a little bit. If we have run out of characters, refill the buffer. Reset the buffer pointer and return the next character. All right, so. Let's read one byte from the file per pass. And that did not work because fatal is a, and we called it error. Right, and we got what looks like two spaces. And yep, it's, oh, it's two tab characters. Let's be a little bit read several. Okay, that seems to be working. So we are successfully rewinding the file. We are successfully reading bytes out of the buffer. Good. Now we wish to start actually reading tokens from the file. Tokens in the Digital Research Assembler can either be words, simple strings, and simple strings are only supported by a very few directives, comments, numbers, which start with a digit and then end with a, uh, a base specifier, in this case it's H. Or, or identifiers, I think I've mentioned identifiers before. Plus a few other things like the dollar sign, meaning the location of the current program counter, commas, arithmetic operators, and so on. An exclamation mark like this is a statement terminator. And these can appear inside comments. Let me rephrase they can terminate comment. So if I look for a comment character followed by a exclamation mark, we actually find one here. So here we have a label definition, then there's a comment, and then there's a function. Now, dollar signs are normally, in context other than this, ignored completely. They are padding used in identifiers to make them more readable. This completely fails from my point of view, but there you go. So, we wish to read an identifier, we read a token from the input stream. And token T, read token. We wish to skip white space. And then the actual token depends on the character we read. Now we've got the assembler documentation here. String constants. I'm just wondering about multi-character symbols. I don't think there are any. It's a really simple language. So we've got single character operators. We've got multi-character words. We've got, of course, parentheses. We do have some precedents. But this means that we can read a single non-white-spaced character from the input stream, and we will know from that character what kind of token we're looking at. 
So let us do this. We do luckily have C-type. Um, I'm also going to need to print, to allow printing of hex characters. I think I've got one of these in stat actually. No, I don't. But I've got one in dump. Here we go. Print hex four, print hex eight. Uh, oh yeah, and I've got the, yeah, let's stick some of these in too. Just to reduce code size somewhat. We don't need print FCB anymore. Yeah, I'll need to go and add these throughout once the program's done, but I won't worry about it for now. So we want to read a token and print it. Token. Okay, apparently is space does not detect tabs. Um, checks for white space characters. Ugh. Okay. Oh, hang on. No, no. That's stupid. Right. That's, res that's picked up a hex 7.4, which is... X74, which is a lowercase t. Excellent. So, let's not use a switch. So, this can be either a end of file character, and we are actually. If it's a if it starts with a number, it is a if it starts with a digit, it's a number, possibly not decimal. We're going to have to keep reading stuff until we reach the terminator base character. If it's a um, let me think if it's a letter, then it's an identifier. This includes instructions and pseudo operations. If it's a single quote, 
it's a string. And let me just double check this. String constants represent blah blah blah, apostrophe symbols. I think is space might be wrong here. Yeah, because this also detects um, new lines and carriage returns, which we want to, which you want, which we don't want to skip. So if it's a space, or if it's tab or if it's a carriage return because we're going to ignore these and use the new line character for to mark lines uh, CPM uses CRLF uh, separators for lines and I think that we also need to check for form, feed, and vertical tab. We want to skip those two. These are very out of date characters that no one uses anymore. But of course, CPM dates from the 70s, so we kind of expect them. Okay, so anything that's not one of these three special characters, we're going to turn into a token directly. So if we get a comma or a plus sign, then we use that as the token value. It simplifies the code no end. Uh, the control Z end of file is passed through as a single character token. So are new lines. So when we run this program, we should get an error. Yep, can't read identifiers yet. Good, I'm getting somewhere. Now, in order to actually read any of this stuff, we have to keep reading characters from the input stream into a buffer and then pass the buffer. Now, there is a strict limit as to how long a token can be. The longest token is a string constant, must not exceed 64 characters in length. So, So we're going to keep reading characters until we get one that is not a valid identifier character. But of course, now we've read the character, we don't want it. So after we've finished reading the identifier, we need to put back the last character we read. Luckily, we can do that. Now, the way we've set up our read byte function is we refill the buffer before reading the byte out of it. This means that 
after you've called read byte, there is always space for one more character at the end of the buffer, uh, at the beginning of the buffer. That's the one we've just read. If the buffer has just been refilled, then this will be the first byte in the buffer. If we have just read the last character, input buffer read count will be OX80, but we haven't refilled the buffer yet. So unreading a byte is as simple as that. And we can unread a single byte only. That should be fine. Yes, input buffer read count will never be zero after you call read byte. All right, so we, to read the identifier, we now need to If it's a dollar sign, ignore the dollar sign. Don't attempt to read it. If it's not an identifier, now what are the valid identifier characters? Is it going to actually tell me? I don't think it is. Brilliant. Uh, there you go. Identifiers can be all characters are significant except for the embedded dollar symbol. Great. Uh, any kind of formal definition? Oh yeah, there's some stuff that we're just ignoring in the spec. So the, the ancient digital, digital research assembler actually has backwards compatibility features for an even more ancient assembler, which I'm just going to ignore completely. This is the processor technology assembler. Oh yeah, we've got about comments. Oh, comments, yes. Um, right, I'll talk about comments later. Let's just stick this in the... And also, I forgot about pling characters. Pling characters are treated as new lines, so we just do we just do that. That should suffice. Though we are also going to have to put some code in here to keep track of line numbers. Okay, this is not actually telling me what the valid characters in an identifier are. So let's take a look at the source code. I'm looking for interesting looking 
string constants to try and identify where the parse code is. Yeah, this is checking, this has read a character and it's now checking for um, various interesting values. So here we say check next character for numeric value. Oh, that's actually a helper. Okay, so uh, Al num return zero fag if not alphanumeric. That does suggest that identifiers need to be you know, accumulating an identifier. Is it a dollar sign? If so, skip it. Is it alphanumeric? Yeah. Uh, right. That suggests that it only this will only support letters and numbers, which frankly is a terrible idea. Uh, we're going to do we're going to do a bit better than that. So um. oh, there's an is blank. What does is blank do? Space or a tab? Yeah, we could use is blank here, but let's not. Right, you see, I was hoping there would be a... Yeah. I was hoping there'd be a standard C-type function for returning identifier-like characters. So basically we want is this alphanumeric or is it an underscore? That is going to be a extension to the syntax. So if our, if the byte we've just read is not alphanumeric, but is not an identifier, then terminate the loop If the token buffer is full, fail. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to be using this from multiple places, so. Okay, so when the loop exits, the last character read in C is not part of the identifier. So, unread byte C. very deliberately only being 7-bit safe. Are we only being 7-bit safe? No, we can do better than that. We can be 8-bit safe. Change that to an int. Okay. Does that build? No, it doesn't.
Right, we have read the token identifier is minus one, which is being reported as FF, which is great. Let's just change this to uh, this. So we have, I hope, successfully read our token. I didn't have a print hex 16. Need one of them. Miss the initial character. The initial character is, of course, in C here. Now we know that C must be zero, so we can just do we can do this. Right, we've read a token and it is title. Now there's actually some more work we want to do here. We actually want to be, want to resolve the identifier in the symbol table, but we haven't done the symbol table yet, so let's just let's ignore that for now. I will right now I've been testing with the actual with this actual file, but I'm going to switch to a different one. Right, we want a number. Can't read numbers yet. Oh yeah, how big is our one k? Uh, could be smaller. Again, a lot of that's boilerplate. A lot of it's the print stuff that we will actually be using eventually. So uh, is that has actually been compiled? Yeah, it has been optimized. Uh, CPM's only, it says it's designed for 16-bit machines, we only have 64k to, to play with at all, some of which will be used up by CPM itself, that's 3.5k, some of which is the BIOS, which is on a, on a decent CPM, that's typically half a kilobyte, so that's 4k taken away from the total. Now we don't actually have to store anything in memory other than our program and the symbol table. So it should be okay. But bear in mind that the actual assembler written in hand tool machine code is 8K. So we've already reached an eighth of our budget. So numbers, numbers. So this is very similar code. We wish to read a uh, we wish to read bytes out of the stream in this case the uh, a numbers may consist of digits or alphabetic letters that is actually specified in the manual. Now here's some examples. Oh, you can add dollar signs as well. Let's put that back in. 
the terminator for a number is the type specifier which is binary octal okay right so that means we can't actually use the character we read to identify the terminator because b is a perfectly valid hex digit right so we in fact do need So that reads a number into the token buffer, but it does not parse it. Strings. Strings need to be read into the token buffer as well. Now, strings are different because strings have uh, uh, a start and end character. Also, I have forgotten to call this. So, for strings, we want to skip the initial apostrophe and start reading characters and writing them. So, we don't want to uppercase everything. So read a character. If it is if it's a new line, that is illegal. If it's a single quote that is the end of the string. Oh, no, it's not. See, I'm thinking of C type strings that use an escape character, but the assembler strings do not. Assemblers use a double apostrophe. So in fact, if we read an apostrophe, we need to read another byte And if this is also an apostrophe, then we wish to add the apostrophe to the buffer. So if the second character is not an apostrophe, then yes, exit the loop. Otherwise, write the string to the buffer and on exit from the loop C will contain the character immediately following the terminating apostrophe therefore we need to push it back into the buffer and this is wrong here I mean this will work but uh, Various other illegal cases will not be picked up. So in fact, we want to do if, for example, end of file. We don't want to just keep reading end of file characters into the buffer. So I think we want is print here to indicate, uh, is that the right one? Checks for any printable character, including space. Now I want is control. What 
What's it complaining about with that? So that's reading a uh, so that should be reading a string into the buffer. So yep, that has read fnord. If I put one of these in, that should read that's correct. And if I take this off, right, that seems to be working. Okay, the next step is we now need to start doing stuff like parsing numbers. Now, parsing the number, we wish to look at the last character of the of the thing we've read. And this may be a base specifier. So this will chop the last character out of the buffer, out of the buffer, and then we can test it. So binary, octal, more octal, decimal, okay. Binary, octal, Decimal hexadecimal So if the last character is a decimal digit, then the base is base 10, and we don't want to have deleted that last character because it's valid. Right, we now have the base set and uh, the token buffer contains just the, the number. So let's actually go to two, three, four, five, six, A, B, C, D, E, H. Why is that still got the H on it? If F, F, E is minus two, which is a number.
so right on entry token length is two indicating it's read two characters which is the one and the h Right, that is as I expect. Token length is now one on exit from the routine. So token buffer dole. Right, that's better. We now wish to start actually parsing the value. And we do this by going from the left We wish to so we resolve. Uh, So we turn the character red into the value of the digit. We check that the digit is in range. And we add it to the accumulator. And yeah. so. When we read a number, we return the token number identifier and on exit, the token number variable will contain the value. Yeah, this is STCC is not actually doesn't do proper flow uh, flow analysis. Okay, no warnings, and the value is correct. So test as a one H. So one two A B H. That's cor looks correct. Let's change this to a Z. Valid digits and character constant. Two, three, four decimal. O four D two. Yeah. Oops. Yep. Binary. Nope. Seven seven. Yep. Yeah, probably. Okay, that looks like it's more or less working. 
So we are now correctly parsing numbers. So what's the damage? Yikes. Nearly half a kilobyte. Not all of that will be the numeric stuff. But that's still not brilliant. I'm wondering whether we can make this a little bit better. I so I'd expect that this switch statement compiles into a just a series of you know if elses. Ah, it'll do. Uh, identifiers we haven't done yet. Strings are fine. We don't need to touch strings. Comments. Yep, comments. Now the obvious thing to do with a comment is to just like read characters until we reach the terminator which is either a new line or an exclamation mark. But actually it's a little bit more complicated than that because we want to read the comment and emit it into the output print file. So if I reassemble our CCP and you look at the print file, you see it's actually got all these comments in it. So I think that we're going to need to read the comment hmm. So the way this print file is created is that this column here is just a copy of the source line. What that means is that I th think in order to replicate this, our read routine here is actually going to have to be different because we're going to need to read a complete source line from the file into memory so that we can then output the complete source line to the print transcript and then read bytes from that source line. That's a shame. Yeah, let's go with that. In which case, uh, this piece of code here, uh, when reading the comment, <coughs> all we do is eat characters. And in fact, things are a little bit different because we need to, if we see a comment, then we actually have to read more bytes. So we're going to do this. And do. This would actually be an ideal place for a go-to, to be honest. Go-tos are good for this kind of state machine. If if we see a comment character, then we just start eating stuff until we see an exclamation mark, a new line. 
or an end to file character. And if we have read a comment and we see one of these things, then we'll loop back again and continue reading. No, no, that's not right. Oh, no, no, I'm overcomplicating this. Right, we read a byte. If it's a comment character, keep reading until it's not a comment. Then it's not a comment, so we just continue parsing as before. So in our test file, we get a carriage return token, which is in fact the one here. Uh, oh, there's an exclamation mark. Yeah, I'd actually need a bit more test code. Okay, so what that's done is we read a new line character, that's that exclamation mark, sorry, new line token, then another new line token, which is the actual new line, then it's a number, which is the number, and then we read Uh, the new line at the end of line two, the new line at the end of line three, and my CPM emulator pads with zeros rather than with new line characters. So we read zeros. Uh, that's strictly user error because I should have a control Z at the end of the file. And you see it has actually read the the control Z there. Um, zeros. I think in the interests of sanity. Let's put a uh, Let's put one of those in. Okay, so zeros are now translated into end of file characters. Right, so where have we got to? We are parsing numbers. We are parsing identifiers, but not looking them up in the symbol table. And we are parsing strings. So the tokenizer is looking solid. I think that's done. So let me just uh, check all this lot in. Oh yeah. Okay. Right. We're beginning to approach the bit where we need to start talking about symbols. Because the way the assembler is going to work is it's going to accumulate uh, named values internally. Every identifier, like every identifier, will resolve to a symbol in the symbol table. 
and we're going to look up these symbols here in the identifier code. If a symbol is not in the symbol table, then we will create a new symbol table entry for it of a particular type that means this symbol is not defined yet. And then when people actually try to refer to it, that will cause an error. There's a reason for this. It'll make life easier later on. So we're going to have to start talking about the symbol table. So the symbol table. One thing you may not have noticed is that this program contains no dynamic memory allocation. This is because my runtime library does not actually support dynamic memory allocation. Malloc and friends are kind of expensive and we're not using them. Instead, what you get is a simple array of bytes which contains all the memory in the CPM system that is not otherwise used by the program itself. And we are going to put our symbol table in there. So there's various ways we can do this. Uh, the way, the cheapest way if you're writing in machine code is to just use an array of variable size structures, but we are actually working in C, so we want to do things a bit differently. So we are, we define a symbol which consists of a null terminated name. the numeric value of the symbol a callback which contains a pointer to some, some, to some code which is essentially the symbol type this is going to be a routine for doing something with the symbol and a pointer to the next symbol now the overhead because we're in C is two bytes for the pointer and two bytes for the next symbol but this gives us a lot more flexibility and we're going to store the symbols as a linked list but we're going to be a bit cleverer about that and we're actually going to use a hash table so the bottom few bits of the identifier we're going to use five bits for 31 entries. Uh, 32 entries even. Initialized to nulls. So the way this is gonna work is that to look up a symbol, we take the bottom five bits of the first character. So exam for example, if we have a symbol flawed, then the bottom five bits of that F are uh, X or six. So we look in the sixth slot in the hash table, and this gives us a linked list of all the symbols beginning with F. This should drastically reduce the time needed to actually look things up in the symbol table. So we actually add symbols to the table at this point because we want to resolve them. So we actually go strip symbol. So that gives us the slot.
that gives us the first symbol in the chain. So for each symbol in the chain, we wish to compare the name with the the one in our token buffer. Now let me think. I believe that I actually want to change this a bit. So rather than zero terminating the strings pointed to by the symbol, we're actually going to store the length of the name in the symbol structure. Now the the 8080 and Z80 are uh, they don't have strict alignment, so this pointer is two bytes. This is one byte, therefore this is aligned to three bytes, but we don't actually care. On a more modern machine, we'd want to do this, so that these four two-byte values are all aligned. In fact, we might as well do that anyway. So, If the lengths match, or rather put it another way, if the lengths don't match, then we know the nay, we know this is not the right symbol. If If the strings are the same, then we have found our symbol and we just return. If, however, we get to here, then we have not found our symbol. So we need to allocate a new one. Now, to allocate memory, we are actually going to put in some more code. Oh, hang on. Silly me. Okay. So heap pointer is going to point at the top, oh, sorry, at the bottom of unused memory. And as we allocate stuff, then heap pointer is going to advance. And eventually it will hit the top of memory, and we should probably check for that at some point, but I'm going to skip that for the time being. So. That is our allocation function. There is no provision for freeing memory because we never will. This is traditional memory allocation strategy in compilers. Compilers accumulate stuff in the heap and then terminate. And because all memory is automatically freed on termination, you don't need to keep track of it. So. We want to allocate enough memory 
for the name. Done. We wish to allocate enough memory for a symbol structure, which we then initialize. She can do this the other way around. Add it to the linked list on the front. The value is zero. The callback is unset to mean this symbol has no type. Oh, hang on, that didn't work. Uh... Should be defined. Oh, I called it CPM top. Why did I call it CPM top? That's a stupid name. Let's do that. Okay. So let's take our test. Routine and go Lord. So those are two symbols that should be allocated. Here is another symbol that should refer to the same one as in line one. And the one in line four should refer to the same symbol as line two. That did not work at all. because I actually forgot to open symbol. Yeah, I'm, uh, I should probably pause and get some tea. I have just paused and, you know, make dinner. But tea always helps. Pointer's just wrong. So here we have the map of where things are in memory. You can see the top of RAM is uh, A3F, which is here. makes me wonder whether this has not actually initialized the variable correctly.
No, that looks okay. I can see the heat pointer advancing, so that looks like that bit's working correctly. Token symbol. Yeah, okay, always look at the warnings. 112, function return value mismatch. Yeah, I would expect that to be an actual error. Uh, SDCC strikes again. That's better. Okay, so we see that Nord is at A6F. So the second one is not at A6F. F fabulous. That'll be a bug then. Maybe I want to remember to set that. There we go. Fnord is at A3B. Fnord is still at A3B. Fu is at A49. Huh. Okay, right. Now this... Ooh, this is a tricky one, and we're going to have to fix this elsewhere. Possibly not correct. Yeah. Right. And that's that's not right at all. That skipped the second character completely. So this is the identifier. First character gets added. Second character... Uh. Yeah, I think I seriously do need some tea. That's better. And you see it... The dollar sign is no longer in foo. And the pointers match. Fantastic. So that bar and foo should be appearing in different slots in the hash table. Yeah, I think that's done. Good. So let's now point this back at the CCP. And what do we read? We read the title, which is correct. We read the string here which is correct. Couple of new lines, comments, etc. Why do we have uh, This is not right. Where's that MVI coming from? Right, we somehow have found ourselves here. Uh, what's happened, I'm pretty sure, is that the comment munching code is faulty. And when it sees this, it's actually skimmed all the way ahead to the first exclamation mark, which is here. And now it's started scanning from then on. So let's go and look at that comment munching code. that be here. Ah, right.
right. Okay. And this should be an and as well. So, only eat, only eat comment if the character read is not a exclamation mark, new line, or end of file. Good. So this has read a whole bunch of new lines, which is these ones here. We haven't reached as far as the false. Uh, let's actually just print out some more tokens. There we go. So false is defined. EQ, then a number, then a new line, then a true EQ, not false. Good, that looks like it is working. Okay, the next thing we need to do is to start doing something with those tokens and this means we are going to need to populate our hash table with things that make sense. Now this is one of the reasons I wanted to use explicit names and uh, pointers. And this is going to be a lot of really irritating boilerplate. So that EQ uh, statement, the way this is going to look is we do const Drops symbol q symbol equals so uh, yeah, let's put, put that there. So the symbol name is eq. The uh, length of the name is three. Now this will in fact this will allocate four bytes because it's null terminated, which I'd rather like to avoid, but I'm not sure we can do that. The value is going to be ignored for this. The callback will eventually be yeah, something like this. This will be the code that actually makes EQ happen, but we're going to leave that at zero for now. And next is going to be the next symbol. So. And this needs to go into the hash table. And the hash of E is slot 05. So 34 to 66, it's 32, that's correct. So therefore EQ symbol here goes here. Now that's actually gonna complain due to const issues. That's not complained due to const issues. I'm really surprised. And if you look at the symbols being produced here, 
title is A40, which is obviously a new symbol. EQ here is 136, which is a completely different address range, so it has obviously found this one. Right, so we now have a symbol. And we're going to need to put a whole bunch more in, including all the ATAT opcodes. But uh, let's add one for T actually. Actually, let's use a macro. I should add that our operators are also going to be here. So, for example, plus is 2B. And 2B um, hashed will end up being hex OB, which is slot 11, so 0, which should go there along with the Ks. What this means is that our symbol names may contain non-C identifier things. So ID name So title has found a internal symbol. Okay, value callback. Prototype the title callback, and we can put some code in here. And of course, title will do nothing. That doesn't want to be external. Okay, now this is going to be fragile as hell. Each of these needs to be a linked list, which means the last term of each symbol needs to refer to the previous item in the chain. And then the last of the symbols in each chain it needs to go into the hash table. This is the kind of situation where it'd be so, so nice to have some kind of C metaprogramming beyond like hash defines. But we don't, so I'm going to have to do it the long way. I have in the past resorted to horrible evil to make this happen, but there you go. Okay. Right, we are beginning to get somewhere. We now need to start actually doing something with the symbols we read. Which means we need to understand the grammar of the assembly files. Now, the grammar is defined rather poorly here, but it's essentially
we have a label followed by an optional colon followed by a instruction followed by a comma separated list of operands now the label being the label having an optional colon after it means that the only way to distinguish between labels and instructions is from context so That is a valid instruction. That is a valid instruction. And I can demonstrate. So this is using the original assembler. It has assembled this and I can look at the hex record and 3E01 is this MVI instruction. And if I take the, the colon out, it still assembles into exactly the same thing. But also, that's valid too. So that has now generated 301 and 302. So the way we do this is for each instruction, we read a token, and the token will be an identifier, and it will be either a label or an instruction, and we have to look at the symbol type to determine what it is. If it's a label, then we read the another token, which is the instruction. Each statement can contain exact uh, either 0 or 1 label and 0 or 1 instruction. And the operands depend on the uh, instruction. So what we do is we define symbols for the current label and the current instruction. We read a token now the token may contain a new line new line means end of a Actually, what tokens can we return? Ooh, single character tokens. We have to look these up. Okay. Do we? Can we just treat those as tokens? Do we need to actually put them into the symbol table? I don't think we do. There's not very many of them. There's the, I'm mainly thinking of the arithmetic operations here. And we've got plus, minus, star, and slash. And to be honest, the diff, what they do is very dependent on the exact context. No, let's not put those in the symbol table. So these are just returned as tokens. So
So we want to read all tokens in the file. If it's a new line, skip to the next token. If it's not an identifier, fail. We know it's an identifier uh, and has a resolved symbol. So we are now looking at the first token of the line. This is either going to be a label or an instruction. If it's a label, then we wish to set current label, read the optional colon if it's present, and move on to the instruction. If it's instruction, we don't. So to identify a label, the label will be either the callback will be zero to indicate we cannot actually do anything with it, it's just a value. If there is no callback, it's a label. This, yeah, there are in fact two types of labels. There are EQ labels and there are set labels. And we're going to need to distinguish between them somehow. So I'd rather not allocate another byte, to be honest. So I am in fact going to be kind of terrifying do i yeah that's, that's, sorry I'm, I'm being ridiculous okay So we're going to have a label, a set label callback, and an EQ label callback. What these will actually do if you run them is support an error.
Okay, we've got two macros for instructions and values. Just do that. So if it's a label, then set current label accordingly. Read the next token. If it's a colon, read the next token. Okay. Now, if this is a new line, no, let me change that. If this is not a new line, that is, if there is a next token, then it must be an identifier. And it therefore must be the instruction, so set the instruction. So we have now identified the label and the instruction for the current statement. So call the callback for the current instruction. And we expect this callback to consume all the remaining tokens in the statement so that we're then ready to go back here again for the next statement. Okay, let's see if this does anything. Uh, fails, and of course it does. Called object is not a function. Oh. Oh. Okay, let's see if I can remember the C function pointer syntax. Well, that did a thing. Converting integral to pointer without cast in 26. Ah. Uh, this is token symbol. Right, and it actually detected it was a title and failed. Awesome.
And let's put some generic. I need this in a bit. Yeah, uh, notice that I'm not actually doing any error recovery, which I'm going to have to deal with at stew point. So CPM is so slow that when you're assembling something, you don't really want it to bail out the first time it hits an error. You want it to keep going as long as possible. That is what the the printer listing file is for. The idea is you assemble stuff and you get a log out on the printer with all your errors in it. So all these fatals, well these ones are just for debugging, but this one does not want to stop processing, it just wants to skip the current line and continue, but uh, mark the run as failed. What's happening in line 38? Really? Uh, 390, unreachable code. Oh uh, yeah, okay. That is actually correct. Actually, a thing we could do that would actually improve things a bit. Uh, if we res if we get an end of file, we don't actually want to continue reading from the file at all. So So what I was going to do is, if we read an end of file byte, we just do not advance the pointer so that we keep returning the same byte again and again. Uh, what this will achieve is if we reach the end of a file and there's an end of file byte and then some garbage after it before the end of the block, we don't read the garbage. But if we read an end of file byte and don't advance the pointer and then unput the and unread the byte because this violates one of our preconditions for unread byte, which is that input buffer read count is never zero. Yeah, let's just not do that. So that has correctly reached title here. Now the title pseudo operation should be a list of them somewhere. This reads a string and it just prints it. So if I assemble my CCP, you see in fact, it doesn't even print the string, it just logs this line of the uh, the listing so that you can read it. Let me see if I can... Yeah, yeah. wrong keys. Let me see if I can find the title directive. Huh, it's not there. Interesting. Controlled instructions. No, that's the actual 8080 instruction set. That's interesting. Okay, I'll just make something up then. I'm going to assume that the title reads a string and then we're going to print the string to the console. So,
So we expect a string. We then print the token buffer. We then expect a new line, like so. Right, and we have read the title and printed it. We haven't done anything else. Why haven't we not done anything else? That should have moved on to the next um, next token. Do so you read a bunch of comments? And then we get a a minus one identifier. So can identify as minus one. Uh, ah, I know what's happening. Right, we've got a label, but we don't have an instruction. Which means the current instant is zero, which means when it tries to call the callback, it does does garbage. Uh, CPM has no memory protection, no catching of nulls. In fact, zero is a perfectly valid address, and that is the address you jump to if you want to restart the system. So if there is no callback, if there is an instruction, call the callback for it. Otherwise, We have a bare label. Or, oh, you know, we... Um, we do know we got an identifier. So, yeah. get a bare label. No, that still hasn't worked. Uh, so I presume we get false here, and then we get EQ. Minus... So we are calling a callback. So what is it? our new identifier, we set the callback to null rather than to uh, set label. So, so a set label is one that can be modified by another set instruction. A EQ label is one that cannot. Do you want to set that to set label? Yes, we do. Because we can always upgrade a set to an EQ, but not vice versa. Right, now we hit the EQ. Good. We can lose these. Okay. 
EQ reads its single parameter, which in this case is zero, and assigns this value to the label on the left. Now we are going to need to get into the horrible morass of expression parsing. So what this is going to do is read an expression. Can you have an EQ without a label? I don't think it makes sense, but it may actually be valid. Let's try that. S means syntax error. Yeah, the original assembler's error reporting is kind of terrible. So, yeah, you are not allowed to have an EQ by itself, which is nice because what we put here is to do if no current label syntax error, dead easy, right. If the current label callback uh, I want if the current label is a set label current label is a set label then uh, we actually want to update the value if the current label is an EQ label then we cannot change the value what this means is that the label attached to this instruction is either different, sorry, the label attached to this instruction has already been defined somewhere. We know that current label must be a label of some description, therefore if you pass this it is a set label. So we can just do current label value equals read expression. and upgrade it to a EQ label to prevent anyone else from changing it. And then we then expect the next token to be a new line. Okay. This is going to be our expression parser. Yep, which we hit as the error. Yeah, don't like this very much. It's sort of a bit of a play. So we have, we can define a value and change it. That's allowed. If the value is, if it's a set label, can we then use it? P, what does P mean? Pretty sure that's an error. 
But I think maybe I need three different types of label. I need set labels, EQ labels, and implicit labels that have been defined that are new on the left-hand side of the expression. But which haven't been defined yet. So a undefined label can be upgraded to an EQ label or a set label. Yeah, here we go. Label does not have the same value on two subsequent passes through the program. Phase error is a bane of this assembler. It's it just means something happened without any real information as to what. Okay, we've got Right, so we upgrade undefs to EQs. And for these callbacks to be called, then the labels are used in an instruction context, which is just a simple syntax error. These three callbacks only really exist as a um, uh, as enumeration values anyway. This they will never happen in a proper program. So bare label CB is the the the. Routine that gets called if you use a label in a statement on its own. What that will actually do is it will assign the program counter to the, it will assign the label to the current value of the program counter. And in fact, this is going to want. We're going to be using this in a lot of places. So, like most instructions are going to call that. So, if there is no current label, do nothing. Program counter is a new variable we're going to create that contains the current program counter. Obviously enough. Okay, we're going to have to tackle the expression parser next. The expression parser it actually evaluates a well an expression. This is a infix syntax expression, one of these, 
with operator precedent and parentheses and all that ghastly stuff. Uh, the we have these operators that need to be evaluated. We have symbols that need to be looked up. The syntax is very simple, but uh, it is kind of subtle. The good news is that the output of an expression can only be a uint16. So that's nice. So let's have a look at that then. Well, thanks to the magic of video editing, a cup of tea has miraculously appeared on the table next to me. which means everything is better. Okay, let us tackle this expression parser. I'm not fond of these. They're just fiddly. So we have five levels of precedence and in fact we have a couple more because we've got unary plus and unary minus. So we have leaf values, which are the highest precedence, such as A or B or plus A or minus A, or parenthesis operations. We then have or an XOR, then AND, then NOT. NOT? Why is NOT there? Not is a infix operator, it's a leaf operation. That should be at the bottom. Hmm. Oh, right, I see what they're getting at. Um. Oh, yikes. I... Yeah. Right, what? So this is... not the way C does it. So C, not the not operator, which is pling, applied here, will bind only to C. But in the assembler, it actually binds to the entire following expression. Oh, that's awful. It doesn't list. It doesn't specify a precedence for infix minus, but if. If inflix minus applies here, then this means that the minus binds to 1 times 2, which I don't believe could possibly be right. Uh, in fact, that's a poor example because let's try that. Minus 1 schleff 2. So I'm going to treat the unary minus and plus as leaf oper as leaf operations. So we're going to actually do this as a recursive descent. Parser. And in fact, this is we're going to need some look ahead. We can probably do without it, but Ooh, do we need look ahead? I think we can So, let's 
So if reading the expression includes the terminating character, which is going to be a new line or comma, this means that if I have something like uh, then reading the 1 plus 2 will also include the terminating new line. And if we have some uh, imaginary, hang on, we can do this. Then reading this expression includes the terminating comma, so that reading the next expression includes the new line. The problem with this is that this doesn't tell us what the terminating expression was which means that uh, we don't know with db here whether we have in fact read the terminating new line and therefore need to go on to the next statement or whether we've read a comma and therefore need to read another expression. Now we could put, we could do some look ahead. Uh, this would be a, an unread token function the issue there is that tokens have state attached to them, particularly the token buffer, and we can't save that. So I am actually going to adjust this so that I'm going to adjust this so it returns not the value but the terminating token. And the value can be stored in um, token number. So EQ here so if reading the expression does not result in a new line it's a syntax error right so let's read a leaf expression. And I need to prototype this for reasons that will become obvious in a moment. So what we do is we read a token. If the token is a number, return the value. If the token is a identifier, return the value of the identifier. If the token is a plus sign, then recurse. If the token is a minus sign, also recurse. If the token is an open parenthesis, then
recursion to read expression and expect a closed parenthesis. If it's not a closed parenthesis, it's an error. And return the value. Otherwise, it's an error. If it's a string, then we return the first character of the string. Make sure it is actually the right length. Has that actually uh, right? It doesn't know the syntax error doesn't return, so let's just put that in. This needs to be set. Let's see it. Label Okay. So this is the bottom level expression reader. And this just returns a value. Uh, I wonder if it's, yeah, this just returns a value. We now have multiple levels of precedent to deal with. So let's start with the highest. We've got five levels. So we read the leaf on the left, and we read the operator. The operator may be one of these identifiers or one of these. We're going to need a new placeholder callback. Our operators are mod, schleff, trite, not, and, or an XOR. The values are completely arbitrary, so right, not, op, not, op, and or op XOR. And we need to add these to the um, the hash table. So 
Auto symbol mod. But operator CD. No. Uh, show symbol. Show. Here because alphabetical order. Okay, and let's put these in the hash table and symbol. Uh, whoops, I got my end, my M's the wrong way around. to make sure that this is the last in the chain. This is a XOR. Okay. Does that build? No. That should be an OR. Value is unsigned. Yep. Uh, we just want the value here to be out of range for a character. That's all. Six zero nine four twenty. Yep. Okay. So. Right, if the if it's an identifier then the infix operator must be a operator callback. Otherwise, that's a syntax error. We're actually going to be using that quite a bit, so let's just... She's slightly wondering, I think I should put the other operators in the lookup table as well, to be honest. Uh, 
and we can actually use the callbacks. Um, So I thought that we could use the callback data for to actually do the work. Uh, but we also need to um, be nice to encode the precedence in there as well. The thing is, we can't use the operator callback to do the expression work because the operator callback is called for um, using one of these things as a identifier. For example, if you know someone were to just do mod, then that would be invoked as an instruction. We want that to produce an error, so we have to use the value field for the actual operator thing. Uh, yeah, that should actually be a callback. Um, except the infix ones. Well, there is only one infix one, which is not. But we're not, but our tokenizer is not reading the symbols. Yeah. Uh, it's not turning the single character symbols into identifiers. I mean, we can change that, but I think this is the wrong, that would be the wrong way to do it. Yeah, I think this is wrong. What we actually want is Are shifts shift right arithmetic? Of course it doesn't say. Oh, here it does. Zero fill. Yep. Okay, and the other arithmetic operators are unsigned too. This is not a pointer, this is a value. I mean, pointers and values are both two bytes, but it'd be kind of nice to... Uh, this, this code currently does not have any platform-specific stuff in it other than uh, that memory allocation routine. Yeah, I can think of numerous different ways of doing this. What I'm trying to figure out is which the least bad one is.
what is more I do not believe that this recursive descent approach is quite right because all the logic is going to be the same okay let's actually get rid of all this lot and go back to oh I know what to do I know what to do right, let's put all this lot back again And we also want to add plus minus add sub mole and div. Sort those. Okay. So what we're going to do is that these are all going to be indexes into an operator table. Let's move this up here. So add and sub our precedence one. And is three. Div is zero. As is mod. As is null, not is two, or is four, which left and right is zero. And sub is the same as add, which is one. Okay. So these values are now indexes to the operators table. So when we read an expression, So this is the precedence of the current expression. So this is just going to do read expression with precedence. And the top level is the lowest precedence of all, so do that. So this is the token that we read. 
Now, if it's an identifier, then it must be a callback. which means that the operator comes from the, um, the value. Otherwise, we test it It is either an operator or it is a terminator. If it's a terminator, we just exit immediately. We set token number to be the value we read from the left-hand side and we return the value we read. Right. So now we know what operator we're actually operating on. We look the we look the actual operator up. Now, if the precedent of the operator is greater than our own precedent. then so that will happen here and B so what this will do is we read we will read the a our current precedence is infinite so plus is a lower precedent. So uh, I think I've got my precedences backwards. Yeah, the highest is Gah. okay. Actually, this minute. No, I've got this right. Uh, zero is the highest precedent, four is the lowest precedent, and 255 is infinite precedent. So if the... If the precedent of the operator we've just read is higher than our own precedent, then we wish to bind the current value, bind the operator to the current value. So what this actually does is So what we're doing at this point is we're deciding whether to apply the operator we have just got to our left-hand value
No, hang on. Ah, no, we're deciding what to do with the value on the right. So yeah, I need to undo all that, but... So... Right, if the current operator, let's say the star, we've just read, I'll do this work. Right, we read the A, and we evaluate that. We now read a star. Star is higher precedence than the outer expression, which is infinite. Therefore, when we read the next value, we want to apply the star to it. Yeah, that's just standard left, ac left accumulation. Now, the other direction is more interesting. If we read the A, we read the plus. Ah, right. We read the B, but we don't do anything with it yet until we see the expression, f the operator following. this stuff. So hard to get straight in my head. Right, we actually, we're going to need to stack things. I was hoping to use the CPU stack for this and call this thing recursively. Normally I do this using um, multiple hierarchical functions, but there's so much common code that I think Yeah, let's do some factoring. So this stuff here for reading the token will either, so reading the operator, it returns either an operator or it aborts with, in which case we need to retain the token ID because it's a terminator. The trouble is to avoid look ahead. Yeah, normally you have uh, like the high uh, the low precedence function for handling plus is uh, you either reject the you read the a you read the operator if the operator is not the one you're expecting you rewind back to where and you try the uh, the next uh, the next lower precedence handler. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to stack this. Yeah, this is terrible. And it is going to have to be recursive because we need to be able to recursively call read expression. So which means we have to put stuff on the stack. And our stack's not very big. This is normally known as Dijkstra's shunting algorithm, and I actually have an implementation of it in Calgol. And it's uh, and it's it's gruesome. So many horrible special cases. Yeah, 
if we can avoid the parentheses that will help The other thing you do is you just use an actual parser generator, which is so much easier. And I could do this for this. Uh, I would be using Yak or Bison, and they generate plain C parsers that get all this stuff right for you, which I can then run through uh, STCC and compile it and link it. But they're not small. Yes, I'm actually going to go away and look how this works properly. Okay, let's try this properly. And we are going to be using Dijkstra shunting algorithm. So, we need to maintain a stack of values. and a stack of operators. Right, and we start reading expressions. What am I doing? The T is not helping. We, when we get a token, we resolve it. No, hang on, that's, that's stupid. Um, the very first thing that, that must be a leaf, either a parenthesis operation or a value. So, we actually just read that directly into the value uh, value stack. And the heart of the the operation now starts reading uh, infix operators. So, as before, we read a token, we resolve it to the ID. If it's not a valid operator, it must be a terminator. Therefore, we exit. Now, it may also be a parenthesis, which are handled specially. And we are actually going to take the parenthesis code out of read leaf expression. Uh, are we? I've got some pseudo code from Wikipedia here. actually do this all in one go.
OK. We read a token from the input stream. If it is a number, stack it. If it's an identifier, stack the value. If it's a string, stack the value. If it is a identifier, Oh, hang on. I remember this from last time. This algorithm, I do not believe, is quite right. Yeah. Uh, no, this algorithm is right, but it, it doesn't do unary, unary operators. Because there actually needs to be two phases where you read values and you read operators. Uh, we, that is values and infix operators. Because uh, operators do different things depending where you are. So I believe at this point we are reading left um, we are reading values. So if at this point we have a plus, then the, we really just want to skip it and, yeah, plus is a poor example because yes, we can just, that, that just does nothing. The more interesting one is unary minus because this actually ends up as being zero minus whatever. So I believe that what we want to do is to stack a zero and stack So what we are effectively doing is we are converting unary minus into zero minus whatever. And then we shift into the second phase, which is to read the operator. We also need to cope with parenthesis. And when we receive a parenthesis, we push it. We're actually going to ma mark this in an incredibly dodgy way with a null in the operator stack. And at this point, at this point, we know that there must be a value. Nothing else is allowed. So everything else is a syntax error. Right. Uh, 
And in fact, that op sub is let's not do it like that. Uh, let's add a unary. So you can just add a neg. And this is highest priority. So let's just bump all these to that one, one, three, zero. Make that highest priority. What we end up with on the output of the shunting yard algorithm is postfix. But that's not going to work here because we've actually pushed the operator before we've pushed the value. Okay, break time while I go and look up how bloody unary operators work. Okay, I think I have a bit of a handle on it now. So remove all this. Let's put this here. So we're actually going to So the secret is that when you push the operators, you check the topmost operator on the operator stack and uh, apply it if, but well, you apply operators from the operator stack while they are high or equal associativity to yours. So this actually makes stuff like unary operators fall out in the wash. The thing to remember is that when you see an operator, you don't apply it then and there. You push it onto the stack and apply it later. So what we want to do is if the there is anything on the stack uh, actually let's do it like this If the precedence of the topmost operator is lower, by which I mean higher because my numbers are the other way around, to the current one, then
pop the operator off the stack. We need to record whether these things are unary or binary. Stack, so it's actually the rightmost one that's first. If the thing is binary, then also pop If, on the other hand, it is unary, then okay. And once that's done, we then push the current operator. Right. Now, that's mostly bollocks. If it's a number, push it. If it's an identifier, yeah, as before, push all this stuff. Right now, we need to decide whether this is unary or binary. We can tell from whether the last thing was an operator or a value. So if the last thing was a value, then 
and I'm actually going to adjust my operator stack so that we store op IDs rather than operators themselves. So if the last thing we saw is a value, then this is the infix version. Therefore, it's a sub. Otherwise, it's the prefix version and it's a neg. Parentheses need a operator ID. This doesn't actually appear in the operators table. I'll need to be careful about that. Check the code. Parentheses, you see left power, and you just push it. Uh, yeah, this does actually need an entry in the table, but it doesn't want to call back. Right, identifiers can be infix or postfix. If it's if the last thing we saw was a value, then it's an infix thing. And therefore this must be an operator. So anything other than an operator is a syntax error. If, however, the last thing we saw was a operator, then this is a 
value so push the value of the symbol Right, if the thing we saw is a right parenthesis, then we keep applying operators from the stack until we see an open parenthesis, and then stop. If we didn't find one, then it's an error. If, uh, let me see. Look at the top op ID. If it's a open parenthesis, oh yeah, uh, a closed parenthesis only makes sense if the last thing we saw was value. If it's not a value, then it's an operator. That doesn't mean, that, that means nothing. So if this is a parenthesis, then just pop it and stop. Otherwise, apply the operator. I can do better than that. Okay, that looks reasonable. Um, if it, the token we saw was none of these, then it must be a terminating token to stop. Right. We've now run out of tokens, so we have stuff on the stack and possibly some operators. So, While there is stuff on the stack,
stack. But while there are operators on the stack, keep applying the operators. Now, you can only push a value, you can only push a number if the last thing was an operator. Likewise, strings Okay, you're right, this is, yeah. Unary plus. If the last thing we saw was a value, is an infix operator. Otherwise, then do nothing. Parentheses can only, only an open parenthesis only applies after a operator. Okay. Wow. So actually, these to go here. That goes. This is going to be interesting to debug, I have to say. But it actually looks reasonably coherent now. Uh, if So at this point, everything has been resolved and there should be one item on the value stack. So, Like that. Of course, it's not going to work. Yes, of course, the f uh, of course it's unreferenced. It's supposed not to be referenced. That's kind of the point. And we do also need a neg in there. here so I not put X or in there oh here Okay, well now we get a syntax error, which is a start. I don't imagine for one moment this will ever work, um, but let's just print that. What value did we get from that EQ? Zero, well that's actually correct, which is nice, but it's then not doing the next thing. So we're going to need to put Tundra debugging in here. Well, that's a new line and new lines should not, well, new lines are terminators. Okay, let us dump the stacks.
I'm not particularly enamored of that zero operator. Ah, ah, ah. This would probably help a little. Right, that's better. Okay, so... So the first expression is this one, and this is just a simple literal. So we read a number, we start the loop, nothing's on the stack, so we read a number, we terminate, that value is the one we return. So this syntax error is happening because we're probably getting that not. Let's just put this. Before you ask, no, I don't have a debugger. Or rather, I do, but it's machine code one. I'm not helping here. Yeah, the... So token FFFF is a identifier. This is going to be that not. the one here. Now not is a operator. So we're actually going to hit this. Then we have not seen a value. Do I have these backwards? Oh, not is inf is prefix. So prefix operators only apply, only make sense if the last thing seen is not a value. Right, I'm going to have to do this the other way around. Right. If this is an operator, then... up. If it's binary, then if it's a binary operator, then it must be a scene value thing. So if it's binary, it only makes sense if it, the last thing seen was a value. If it's unary, the, it only makes sense if the last thing seen was not a value. So let's do this. So it's an operator, so push operator symbol value. Yeah, here we are actually pushing the operator value as a value, so that's not good. Else if if it's a label it only makes oh yeah, and uh That's an operator, therefore scene value is false. So if if it's a label, then it only makes sense if the last thing seen was an operator. Right. Otherwise, unknown identifier. I think that's a syntax error. It might be a terminator. Let's try that. Oh, we got something. We got more. So we got a number and it was zero. Done. Uh, let's.
the result was zero. Right, the next one, we got a identify, which is operator six. We got a value, which is zero. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that operator is being applied correctly, but let's try this. Okay, value zero, operator six, result zero. So operator six is not, right? That's the one we wanted. Not CB is Yep, that's the one we wanted. See, this looks like it's working. It is popping. It's popped a value. It's unary. It calls the callback and it pushes the result. Oh yeah, we're also going to have to put uh, star and slash on this list, but I'll leave that until I get the rest of it working. Oh, that's applying the wrong one. Is my unwind correct? No, no, it's not. Right, okay, that worked. So we read uh, a operator, which is six, we read a a label value, which is zero. This is the one we set previously. We unwind, we apply the not, we get minus one. Awesome. That worked. So let's just put star and slash in here. I think it's worth using a switch there.
incidentally, I confidently expect this to be the hardest and most time consuming part of the whole project. There's going to be a long and boring piece of data entry where I add all the opcodes, but seriously, I think this is the bulk of it. Which, given how embarrassingly long it took me to do, is probably a good thing. Use as a prefix, so it only makes sense if the last thing was a val value. All right, there's a it's not a common code here that may be able to do something with. Okay. Right, what are we doing next? Testing EQ false. Oh, the syntax error is from this if statement. Fabulous. Uh, if, uh, yeah, right, conditional compilation. So this evaluates the parameter. It does the usual thing. If it is uh, non-zero, it does the first lot of stuff. If it's zero, it does the second lot of stuff. It's completely standard. Uh, but I actually, before I do that, I'm going to do some testing. And probably go and have dinner. get already defined for this. I think it's that blank line. Yeah, it's the blank line at the end of the file. Okay, let's try some expressions. One plus two is three. Good. Two times three plus four is not good, apparently. So two times. Three. Right, the next operator is plus, which is lower precedence than the two and the three. Do I have that the right way around? And I've got this the wrong way around. Yeah, I am actually, I'm confusing myself by having these the wrong way around as well. So if the current operator is higher precedence 
than the one on the top of the stack. So in this case, it's, it's, it's asterisk. I think I also want that to be less than or equal to. Let's try that. There we go. So let's just double check what that is. 2 times 3 plus 4 is 10. Result, 15. Not what I expected. Uh, I think that's done with this. Uh, he is 14, yep. Right, that has in fact got the precedence completely backwards. So I suspect I've also managed to confuse myself. When there is an operator on top of the operator stack of precedence higher than or equal to the operator we're currently processing, pop it off and apply it. So, if there is an operator on the top of the precedence stack higher priority or equal to, that means having a lower pre precedence number, apply it. So why is it applying this over and over again? Ah! Uh, ah! Uh. It's not reached the unstacking stage, it's still trying to deal with the plus here. I am forgetting to actually pop the stack. Right, 10 is correct. And actually, let's have a bit of a value sp equals stack depth. Also, expression stack flow. Okay, the result of that is 10, which is correct. So let's try this the other way around, which is 15, three times, three times four, uh, 14, it's still 14. Okay, that's worked. I'm impressed so far. Let's try that. And it fails. Right, it's trying to apply a parenthesis. Which we don't let it do. So if the thing on the top of the stack is a parenthesis, do not apply anything, we'll deal with it later. I 
I think. So what's this done? Okay, we have a open parenthesis, which is pushed onto the stack. We have a value, 2. We have a operator, add. We have a value, 3. We come across a parenthesis. Uh, I don't need this piece of code here because parentheses have infinitely low priority, so that will come out in the wash. Okay, is this one? So it's trying to unwind the parentheses. So we pop off the op ID. If it's a parenthesis, do nothing. Wait a minute, zeros, zeros an add. Right, okay. And we get 14, which is the right result. Uh, hang on a second. F 14 hex is 20 decimal. Right, that's the right result. Okay, I believe this is looking like it's working or at least enough to go on with. So let's let's take the debugging code out. And then we'll see what's the Let's see how that goes. Um, I've missed an applying. Yep. Yeah, I ain't deleting any of this code. I'm sure I'm gonna be needing it to debug future horrible things. Right, let's see how big our assembler is. 4K? That's going to have the bulk of the complexity in it. Uh, yeah, this is going to end up being bigger than the hang tool assembler, which is not really surprising. But I think it's probably going to be okay. Okay, I need to go and sort out about dinner, but I will be back in an instant. Okay, dinner has happened and my blood sugar is up again, so let's have another go at this conditional assembly. I also took the opportunity to look at the original assembler implementation. Now, there's two ways to do this kind of conditional assembly. 
The first way, let's say testing here is false. The first way is to read and parse each statement, but then not actually do anything. This lets you uh, guarantee that the statements you're skipping over are syntactically invalid. The other way, the wrong way, is when you hit the if statement, you just start reading tokens until you see an else or an end if. And I am very glad to say that it looks like the original assembler is doing it the wrong way because that's a lot easier to implement. Now, this does mean uh, you can still do nested if statements, but I don't know if it supports it. Let's actually give that a test and see. So, uh, so if one that should produce an error message. Uh, oh, that actually created a label, so let's do that too. Right, that has created a syntactic error error message. So change that to zero, it doesn't. interesting. Why has that... If... Ah, I think I know what's going on here. I think that... Let me do a little bit more. Let's actually generate real instructions. Right, well. Interestingly, the documentation here does not re does not describe else at all. Which makes me wonder whether this actually works. So let's change that to through and try reassembling the CCP. P is phase error and um, right, I yeah, so this, when I assemble the CCP using the original assembler, it looks like it's working, but I don't think it is. See, I don't think it's paying any attention. Yeah, it's only it's paying any attention to that else. Is BDOS L actually used anywhere? Yes, it is. Once. Ah, I wondered what this line was doing. Oh, it's these stupid error messages. I failed to register that this was actually an error and not a log. Right, it's complaining that BDOS L has not been is not been referenced, and that's because this else here is not being honoured. So this source code doesn't actually work in the DR assembler. It doesn't really report it very well. Well, let's just quickly hack it so it does work. So it's not actually original. Okay. And what is N? That's another error message. Lines. 
on page 16. N, not implemented. <laughs> right. Yeah, this is intended to be run using Mac. Uh, sorry. This was intended to be assembled using Mac, the macro assembler, which is a much more capable assembler with macro facilities and, you know, else. Okay. Well, that simplifies things for us. Uh, I might implement else because it's easy and will be really useful. But let's do our nested if. So what I'm thinking is that if it supports nested if, it doesn't do anything at all. If it doesn't support nested if, then this if line will scan to hit this end if and assemble this thing. Did that do a thing? Yes, it did. We do not have nested if. Okay, I'll implement it as that to begin with. Extending it will be easy. Right, we want... Uh, two keywords, if and end if. So, if symbol, if not Just make things line up nicely. wants to go to end if symbol like so right that won't build yep so you want our if callback and end if callback Let's do the end if callback first. So the end if instruction will only be executed. Where's my test gone? Will only be executed in this situation. So we hit the end if and we do nothing and we go on. If the if is not taken, if zero, then we're actually going to scan for the end if without executing instructions. So the end if instruction itself will never be executed in that situation. So the end if callback is a oh, no. Right, now the if callback. So the if callback reads an expression and if the token, uh, if the result is non-zero, we take the if. If the if callback is false, then we scan for a end if, which we do simply with um, If this is an end of file, then stop. Or actually, it's do so an error. So 
So if token is an identifier, and it's a end if and stop. And consume the new line after the end if. Right, that should work. Right, expected an identifier. Uh, I have no idea where that happened, so let's actually go and add some line number information. So we need to add, here we go. It's fatal gone. I was hoping to be able to avoid printing in decimal but I reckon that line numbers in hex are a little bit antisocial. So let's find, I have a decimal print routine from stat. It even prints with uh, padding and precision. I don't think we want any of that. It's incredibly crude. I copied the logic from uh, I copied the logic from uh, the old built-in stat dot plm when I was rewriting it. So looking at this, I do wonder whether uh, SDCC has div mod. The way it works is that precision here selects which digit we're actually printing. This line happen this line is reached when it's printing a leading zero. So we don't actually want to print those at all. The original code would allow you to pad it with spaces, but we don't care. So we want uh, if D or not. So if our digit is non-zero, that that is explicit for readability, or we are printing the last digit, which is always printed, or we are not suppressing zeros, then print the digit. Okay. So, print I, line number. Right. That will tell us what line an error happens on. Line one. But of course it's line one because we haven't actually written the code to check for new lines yet.
So we're going to do that by testing for uh, new line characters. I can't actually read these dark blue characters. So if If C is a new line, and I want an actual new line, not a fake one, then bump the line number. Now this will mean that the line number will be incremented before processing the actual new line token, which may not be what I want. In particular, when we get a unexpected new line, it will be on the next line. So we really want to bump the new line here before read, bump the line number here before reading the next character. Which we can do easy enough with state. Okay. So we add a variable to indicator for at the end of the line. So we start reading, we are at the end of the line with the line number is zero. If we are at the end of a line, Increase the line number. We are no longer at the end of a line. So what does this do? All this does is go URL equals true. That should work better. All right, now where do we get to? Line 16, that's a decent way through the program. Org. Now, why are we expecting an identifier here? Ah, org, in the current state, org is a unrecognized symbol and therefore is treated as a label declaration. So it reads this, expecting it to be an instruction, and of course it doesn't work. So all we need to do is add the org word, org symbol. What org does is it sets the origin, that is the program counter. So org symbol, org symbol. And we read an expression. We're actually doing this so often, let's make a helper function for that. Now we had an expect up here. So let's do a equals token number. Yep, that should be fine. Line 17 syntax error. Aha, this dollar sign is a special value that represents the current program counter. That's easily added. It's a, it'll go up here. It's, it's really a number. Uh, 
Okay. Whoa, 43. We're really racing through this. That big comment had nothing to do with it. And it's our first instruction. The first time we actually want to emit something, although this is currently past one, so we won't be emitting anything. Right, now. This is the point where I go looking to see whether I have a nice table of the 8080 instruction set. That was not the one I was looking for. Is this one better? This one's the one I wanted. Now, the instruction set's really simple. This is it. This is all of it. So we've got single byte instructions with registers and things baked into them. We've got two byte instructions with a uh, register baked into the instruction and a single byte opcode. We've got three byte instructions with a two byte payload and yeah, frequently a register baked into the instruction. Jump is really simple. Two byte instruction plus a fixed code. So now the way we are going to do this is that will mean it's a simple one byte instruction. Simple meaning no uh, mutation of the sorry this is a simple two byte instruction three bytes instruction. Simple meaning we're not mutating the opcode itself. So we create a jump instruction with the value being the opcode, which is 1100C0113. And jump. Don't need that prototype because that's done for me up here. Right, and now on entry. Current inson will contain the instruction being executed, which means it's got the value in it. Now there's two things that need to happen here. One is we need to process and parse the instruction itself. And the second is we need to set any implicit label that's currently in effect. So the first is easily done by calling set implicit label. Now, now we need to read the payload, which is an expression. Like so, very easy. At this point, we will then actually emit the bytes, which we can do with, you want to emit an 8-bit value, which is the value. And then we want to emit a 16-bit value, which is the result of the expression. And that is it. That is everything we need to generate all the uh, simple three-byte instructions in the instruction set. We need to, well, we need to add them to the symbol table, obviously, but they will all have this callback, and this value will contain the opcode. Now, that's failed because we haven't actually written emit 8 and emit 16 anymore uh, yet. So let's do that now. Let's put that here. Uh, yeah, I seem to change my mind about making all the functions static. So making them static is best, better practice but it also makes debugging a little harder because with SDCC they don't show up in the map. Right. So. Let's 
So if we are on pass one, uh, increment the program counter, but do nothing else. Otherwise, fail. Likewise for emit 16. Yes, I know they're unreferenced. So during pass one, all we're doing is accumulating the, uh, is determining where everything lives in memory. So we're not actually going to omit anything. We're just going to keep track of the fact that this is a one byte instruction, that this is a one byte thing, this is a two byte thing, etc. And when we get to pass two, we've actually have some fixing to do, but then we will start actually emitting code. And I've had some thoughts about that, which I'll get on to later. Okay, we've got our first two instructions. DB. Now, DB is one of our first interesting instructions. What this does is it emits bytes but it's a little bit special. Let's put that here. Okay, DB, contain, DB takes as an argument a comma separated list of values. Let me find the and it is special in that one of the, in that you can use as a value a non-zero length string. So, like this. Now, the reason we went through all that pain with the expression parser and dealing with look ahead is so that we can figure out where these arbitrary length uh, expression, uh, the arbitrary length parameter lists end. But I've now had the thought that we can't actually identify strings. Because if we try to read a string as an expression, it'll just fail. So you see, that is a string. Because we need to look at what the next token is in order to decide whether it's an expression or a string. Also, I noticed something in passing, which is you're allowed to use two byte strings for words, so we're going to have to do something there as well. Now, how do I do this? Right, the obvious thing actually is we're testing if the token length is one, and we also want. To is if we see a string and it is a long one, no actually, I think I know what to do here. If we see a string, and 
there is nothing pushed onto any of the stacks. Then we terminate immediately without doing anything. And we terminate with a with with token string as the value. Now what this will do is we'll be able to detect this here. So we actually want to start reading stuff. If if we terminated with a new line, or a comma, then we want to emit the value red. But if we terminate with a string, then we want to emit the entire contents of the string Then we wish to read any new line or comma which is coming next. Because we know there must be a terminator next. And we keep looping doing this until we hit a new line. Does that work? Token comma. There is no such thing as token comma. Line 52, expect an identifier. We got to... Well, we got... We did this bit. Or at least we did something. DS. Now, DS ought to be straightforward. What DS does is it creates uninitialized memory. It's, well, yeah, it's exactly the same as uh, bumping up the program counter. So let's go and add that. Now, I've no idea if any of these are doing the right thing yet. We haven't started to, we won't know that until we reach pass two. So we expect an expression. Oh yeah, we want to, very important, need to set the labels. We need to do that here too. All these things need to set a label first. In fact, actually, 
actually so the only the only pseudo operations that won't set a label is eq and set I wonder if we can do this more cleverly. Probably, but we can also do it more crudely, which is which works just as well. There we go. That's much better. Now we can remove three bytes of code from every single one of these. Right, DS, expect expression, program counter plus equals token number. Sorted. Oh yeah, we haven't done set yet. Set is a... Set is actually a copy of EQ except... If the label is a... If the label is undef or set, then we are allowed to change it. If it's a EQ, then you can't. So this becomes a set label. And let's just add that to the list table two. Three item chain. Yeah, adding all these opcodes is going to be a bind. Ooh, expression stack underflow. That's a new one. Line 52. Interesting. Com buff is defined here, so if I just paste that into my test program, why can we not create the output file? Delete print FCB. I don't. I think I did. Why is it trying? to open
Okay, what did I do there? Open output files called twice, and only twice. I wonder if this is Stack Overflow. Yeah, I think it's Stack Overflow, because it's somehow calling open output file more than once. Right. Uh, so it's calling this relatively complicated function, but it's not recursive. So why would it be using lots of stack? But the easiest way to fix that is to just double the amount of stack and see if we get the same error. We get it. We get the same error. Okay, it's not stack then. I think it may be that. Yeah. Yeah. Right, okay, what's happening is that that oops, instruction callback is garbage. Ha. That instruction callback might be null. Ooh. Now that is interesting. No, the instruction callback might be null, and also current insen might be null. So let's do current insen. The callback is never going to be null, so we do want. Yeah, it's actually a lot easier than I was, than I was thinking. Okay. Right, that's better. Let's move that to tracing. Debug. See, I told you I'd be needing this stuff. Okay, what's it doing? Value push value. Operator minus. Ah, right. We're getting the. We're seeing the first parenthesis, which is, of course, infinitely low precedence, which means that the thing on the stack is higher precedence. So it's trying to apply it immediately. But we haven't actually pushed any values yet. So, in fact, we don't want to call push operator Uh, 
maybe a parentheses need to be infinitely high precedence. Parentheses. Let's just push it and not do anything about it. I actually need to rename those symbols to something better. Okay, that did a thing. Good. Let me see if I can remember. Just... Trying to remember my Vim regex syntax. Okay. We want to change push operator followed by a parenthesis to push and apply operator. Now we want to change push operator raw to push operator. Right. Oh yeah, and that's produced the right result too. Good. Let's try our CCP again, line 54 syntax error. Uh, syntax error. Ah, this is the first time we have one of those optional colons. So we need to check for them. Uh, oh no, we are doing, we are checking for them. So we've read the identifier. It's been added to the symbol table as a label. If it's a label, then we set current label pointing at it, read the next token. If it's a colon, we read another token following, that will be DW. So it's not a new line. It is an identifier, therefore it should be, well actually it won't be an identifier because it's not in the symbol table. Okay, I know what's going going on here. It is an identifier. It's always going to be an identifier because reading the token has added it to the symbol table as a value. So uh, it has the callback here is actually calling undef cb just calling this now the most common failure case for this is going to be that it's just not an instruction we know about there you go, line 54, unrecognized instruction. That is a DW.
Okay, now DW, we're going to have to do something here. Uh, this because we need to support 16-bit string constants. That's actually straightforward. I just need to try and figure out the endianness. In most cases, string length is restricted to one or two characters, which means string becomes eight or 16-bit. You go the second character to low order, that's big endian, which is not the ordering of the 8080. Okay, the way to do that is up here in token string. That's not going to work, this bit here. So what I was going to do is what I was going to do is do that and Well, I still need to do this, so I'll do this. I can do better than that. Okay, that should make this, the string constants work. If it's, we read the first byte, if it's a two byte constant, then we read the second byte and adjust. Uh, if the token length is wrong, then we error out, otherwise you push the value. Right, what's going, going to go wrong here is if this is a DB, and you have a 16-bit character constant at the top level, then this is going to return out and return 16-bit, um, and the character constant will be written as a string. That will actually work with db. It won't work with dw. So what happens with string constants in DW? Right. 
where our ASCII strings to length one or two are allowed, but strings longer are disallowed. Yeah, I'm going to do this the bad, the bad and cheaper nasty way. So this but this hack is only going to go into operation if it's a DB. Right, this means in the DW code, we are never going to get a token string output, which means that our code is actually quite a lot simpler. So we read the expression. We emit it. Until while we get while we read commas, and we want to do it that way around rather than testing for NL because we might receive an end of file. Let's change this as well. So if If t is a string, then we do the string code. Otherwise, just emit. There we go. Simpler. Okay, 96 unrecognized instruction. So we've got all the way up through here to 96, which is a mov. Right, we're going to... Ah, well, mov is actually a little bit interesting. Mov refers to registers. It's got two register parameters. Now, the way the assembler handles registers is incredibly crude. It's actually in the spec and everything, which is they're all in the symbol table. They've got values. And the actual values here are the internal 8080 register numbers. So we need to add them to the symbol table. So value symbol A7. So values have uh, no callback. I 
strategy. Because they have no callback, we can test that here. No, actually, you do have a callback, though. EQ. So E. Oh, no, there is no F. HLM. The. It's H4. Yeah. So the 8080 and the Z80 use. Uh, let me rephrase. The 8080 is a uh, extension. The Z80 is an extension of the 8080. So if you're used to the Z80, these are all the same registers you've got there. Uh, but they all have different names. Six is M, SP, and PW. And the names are all a bit weird. SP is, I will use a six. And PSW. Yeah, um, so that the same names are used to refer to both 16 and 8 bit registers. So if you use B in an 8 bit register, it refers to register B. If you use it in a 16 bit one, it refers to the BC register pair. We could add aliases to these numbers to make that a bit easier, but that's not what the DR assembler did, so I won't just for now. Okay, I need to double check the chains. Okay. A symbol. B symbol. Yeah, I'm quite certain that I'm going to screw this up at some point. Okay. MSP symbol and PSW symbol. Right. Does that build? That builds. Doesn't work yet, but. Right, we now want the. That was MOV, wasn't it? M. Mov, Mov EA. So we want to add that. Right now, Mov, if you go look at our table, Mov has two registers encoded into it. So you've got the destination and the source. I believe that is the only instruction that does this. It is. So it's going to have to get its own dedicated callback. And so the value is unnecessary. expressions which are the uh, 
destination and the source respectively. Ah. Of course, expect expression expects there to be a new line, but this is not a new line. And we wish to uh, emit that. So the opcode is uh, four zero plus the destination right left plus the source. Right. Okay, and that gives us a syntax error. Now, I want to know whether that's... Why is they that giving me a syntax error? That just seems to be the wrong... It's gone from unrecognized instruction to syntax error. Here. Let's just do that. I think so I have a bit of a suspicion that it's not getting past the mov, but let's double check that. Actually, I think that I wish to just put some hack tracing in. So if we have the instruction, we are going to print Like so. That should just list all the instructions it sees so we know where it gets to. Right. So it doesn't like C. It thinks C is an instruction. Yeah, okay. So it's seen the MVI. It thinks it's a label. So it's... C is a EQ label which it's tried to call. So I'm going to have to put a better error message in for EQ label. do the right thing yep okay so we now want to add the MVI instruction right what does MVI do MVI has a destination in the middle instruction in fact there are a number of these but this one takes a byte operand. And I think that is the only instruction that does that. So it will also need its own de dedicated callback. syntax it sees. Yep, so we've got a register followed by a 16-bit constant. So 
So we omit the instruction, which is uh, 06. And then we omit the value. OK. Uh, right, and we're now on line 100. We've actually done all these instructions. Push B. Now push is a simple one. It uses a register pair value, which is just a register number. You can see from here, 00, zero is BC, which is zero. zero. 01 is DE, which is D. No, it's not. Wait. It's the top two bits of the register, the three bit, three bit register value. And yes, PSW is used in push and pop for that. That's why we defined it to six, one, one, oh. Right. So that has a, there's a number of these instructions that use a register pair. Push and pop both take no operands. LDAX and STAX take no operands. Okay, so we can actually use, oh, so, so do all these. Yeah, all the register pair instructions are the same format, which is nice. So, push symbol. And the base instruction is 1100101, which is C5. Um, we also do pop at the same time because we're here. And pop is C one. Right, so here's the callback that makes it work. doing this actually. Like so. And what does this get us to? 
Ooh, why is print char being parsed as a instruction? Because there's a call. Uh, we shouldn't have got that far yet. Oh yeah, we're here. Uh, yeah, Vim syntax highlighting for assembly thinks exclamation marks are comment characters. Okay. Call is a simple two byte instruction. And its opcode is one one oh oh one one oh one, which is CD. And we already have simple three B in place for jump. Push, call, pop. Why is that spotted a morph? That's a ret instruction. So, so what have we got here? Oh, well, we actually have a line number. Oh, we're down here already. But ah. Ooh, I'm going to have to be careful of that. There's a lone instruction here. It thought that was a label. That is completely valid. So it hasn't shown up in the listing and it's just magically skipped it. I've actually run into this with other assemblers and it is fantastically annoying. It all looks fine except it doesn't work. It just misses instructions. Now this is a simple one byte. Uh, I think we may not even have a function for that yet. Ret is C9. In fact, there's a bunch of them. With uh, different condition codes. And we we'll actually need to encode these as separate instructions. So let's just do that now. These all need hooking up, so red symbol, Z symbol, and of course each one has to refer to the previous one, C symbol.
And this refers to RM. Right. And that fails because I haven't done simple 1B yet. This is not going to be complicated like so. Okay, so we see it actually called ret there, which is nice. And we are allowing 111 again. Uh, aura, that's the one it doesn't like. Aura is another common one. It's an arithmetic operation with a register as the source parameter. So there's a ton of those. Uh, so read the register parameter. Commit. And Aura is a uh, 1011, which is B0. Inks. That's another of our register pair instructions. So there's this, oh, they're still highlighted. We've got inks, DCX, and DAD. And they all have the same format. We've also got LDAX and stacks. So let's just go and add those. So uh, DCX and DAD are Ds. Code is uh, OB. Dad is uh, O nine. Okay, inks is O3. Yeah, I forgot to add if to this, but it never came up because I removed the call to if from the source code. Okay, LDAX and stacks. LDAX is OA. Ok, 
Okay. Right. Oh yeah, how big is our assembler now? Uh, five and a half K. And remember the hand coded one was eight. And we've got most of the logic in place. Uh, we're just going to add some more. All we need to do at this point is add more opcodes. Um, and then do the emission and uh, print logic and it's done. So where were we? One, two, three, we're here. Uh, incidentally, this file is 828 lines long, so... Uh, why is that? Oh. It doesn't like STA. STA is... It's another simple three byte, and the value is three, two. it will do LDA which is next to it which is 3A Inner uh, inner increments a register. I believe it's yeah, it's an eight bit register, so that's going to be a it's a simple ALU destination register. And it looks like There's two of those. Three of the, well, okay, these two don't count. Inner and Decker. I am sus beginning to suspect that I won't get this done today, which is a shame. I want to try and get this all done in a single session. What is, that is, Four and it's what's the value for Decker? Oh, five. I rather like the 8080 instruction set. It's very, very simple. I mean, it's very stupid in a lot of ways and extremely restricted, but you can see all the logic and the patterns to it. Okay, now where have we got to? Oh, I'm done, Eludist. Two nine XRA uh, XRA is another of the ALU source. It does an exclusive all with A. So <coughs> might as well go and add those. Where's 
my Oreo there. And the op code is A8. Okay, let's do the others. We're going to need them. <clears throat> A and A. Zero. Or are we done? X or are we done? CMP. is B8. Always a line 130. LXI. Uh, LXI is another three byte instruction, but it takes a register pair parameter. Where is it? Here we go. So this is a combination of RP and simple 3B. the only one it is the only one so we can get its own callback So we read an expression, omit that, expect an expression, omit that. One eighty. Add a. Okay. So, uh, hang on, I thought we added all these. Oh, there's another batch here, which I forgot about. Is eight zero. ADC is eight eight no more A's so Uh, 
sub and SBB. is 90 SVB that it I think so okay how are we getting on line 191 CPI uh, now we get to all the ALU ones again except with simple one byte instructions Pair with immediate. Now, with luck, they should all be and they are in fact different opcodes. So that is FE. That's a simple two byte actually. should be a db there okay xri is ee -E. ORI is F6. ANA is A0. Uh, hang on. What was I looking at? A N A. Yep, A Z is the wrong one. I want this one. Is E six. And I have, in fact, not set the callbacks correctly for these. So let's go through them again. CPI, XRI, ORI. CPI, XRI. ORI. This batch, SBI and SUI, they are uh, D, E.
and I've also completely lost track of whether I've remembered to update the hash table. It's UI I'm willing to bet that is going to be D7. It's it's not, it's D6. So that is SUI symbol or I, yep, I didn't update add. That's A and I. CPI. Uh, now I need ACI and ADI. ANI, really? Oh, that's AND. That's the one down here. ADI and ACI. ADI is C6 and CE. Okay, now let's try it. And I haven't done simple 2B. Right, 198, JZ. Now we've got to do all the jump instructions, of which there are a bunch, because they're more of the condition code things. So where are all my condition code rets? Here they are. So we just want to copy those intact over to here. Oh, I forgot to update any of the opcodes for those. Yikes. Um, okay. So they are, in fact, uh, CO with the condition code high. So that's... That's in fact zero, yep. Zero eight, zero eight, zero eight, zero eight. Uh, C, D, E, F, eight. Yep. Okay, so let's just use these and copy again.
Okay, what are the jump op codes? They are the same as the ret op codes with the bottom two bits set. So that's going instead of alternating between zero and eight, it's going to alternate between three and uh, eleven. B. Yep. Right, two hundred and one. CNZ. You know what this means? More condition codes. These are the conditional call instructions. And these are exactly the same as the RET, except the bottom is alternating between 4 and C. the right op codes. CNZ, yep. Oh, and these are simple freebies. CPI symbol. This is a CM symbol. Two, three, six. That's probably, yeah, that doesn't like Schlud. Schlud is another uh, simple 3B. Wait, why are these... Oh yeah, those are instructions. And the opcode is... Where is Schlud? Uh, 2A. Yeah, I'm getting tired. My ability to parse binary into hex at a glance is suffering. Lud is wait, that's not a three. That's not even an R, that's a two. Two A no two M uh, two two is Schlud. Lud is two A. Yeah. Good news is we've probably got most instructions by now. Yeah. Like we've now skimmed all the way down to here. And it doesn't like the one after exchange. Wait, that's an inks. No, it doesn't like exchange. It knows that exchange is a one byte instruction because it's seen the label, therefore it cannot be another label. And I should need to go through and do the other one byte instructions because I'm not going to get errors about them. So this is E B
H28. Oh, we're at the end. Awesome. Right, end is a special operation that takes a optional parameter and terminates assembly. And we're going to completely we're going to completely fake this with or uh, if uh, token symbol callback equals ncb break and ncb itself is a no op it will never be called so okay now we've reached all the way to the end and now we started again from the beginning and now we are starting on pass two when actually stuff needs to happen and the first thing that happens is that we get an, a label already defined error. Now, this is because there is already this label is actually defined in pass one. But you know what? I am not going to look at that right now. Because instead, I need to go through and do the rest of the the simple instructions. Because they say I won't get warnings about these, so I just have to remember to do them. So, not halt EIDI. Uh, we haven't done those, haven't done those, PCHO, haven't done the resets, done that, done that. Set carry, we haven't done any of them, done those, decimal adjust, we've done those. Done exchange. So it's these ones. And yes, these resets are more condition codes. Right. Uh, in and out are actually simple 1B, so let's do them. So the command shell doesn't actually do have any machine I.O. in it. Uh, D3. So it never calls in or out. In, out. Okay, well, there are a bunch of those. Uh, those are the resets, because those are the hard ones. Those are rather the annoying ones. At least they're ours. No, hang on. No, those aren't condition codes. So this is the system call instruction. It, uh, it jumps to a set of vectors at the bottom of memory and which vector is determined by this value here. 
So it's just uh, one one zero C seven. This is a. This is an ALU dest. Because the three dip the three bit reset vector is in exactly the same place as for an ALU instruction. So those three ends are the same as for one of these. So we can use the same routine, which is nice. Okay. Let's O O one O O one 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 is two seven O seven O F one seven one F two F three F three seven uh, E nine, E three, F nine, F A, no, F B, F three, seven six, Okay, and these are all oops. simple one B's. Very many H's. There is 
one in. We don't have very many ins. There is one P. There's lots of R's. Two S's. And an X. X T H L. The distribution of keywords is interesting. No F's, G's, K's, Q's, U, V, W's, Y's, or Z's. Okay, so is that going to work? Oops. Right, that failed to look something up. That means that I have an infinite loop in my uh, in my chain. There we go. That should be inner. Right. So we get all the way to the bottom and we are now starting on pass two. So let's nuke this, run that again. Uh, let's actually fix title, shall we? because we only want to print it once. And let's also print just some progress information. Okay, so let's commit that. Actually, I'm not going to finish this tonight. It's at 11:30. Uh, heaven knows how long I've been working on this. And, but I do want to get it actually, like you know, showing bytes. So, all right, the stuff I was talking about about the labels. The second time through, we expect to define all the labels in the same place. So we have these tests to see is the label already defined. However, if it, we do want to allow people to set the value to the same thing next time. So we're going to change this comparison. so that we only produce the error if the 
value is different. And the same applies here. So you're actually allowed to call EQ to set the same label as often as you like, provided it's always the same value. Okay, now we've got to the point where we're actually emitting things. And I don't think I need to change this one. All right, so. And let's just. Let's just do some really crude debugging. So Whoops. We always want to adjust the program counter. So in fact, this goes like this. Huh. That assembled. I mean, I've no idea if this is right, but that's definitely not right. Okay. So, we set the origin to 3400 and we start doing stuff. So, we've got CCP start and CCP clear. These should not be zeros. CCP start is to find way down here. Yep, those are wrong. Uh, we then get the 7F and the 0 and then all the 20s from here. And we get the copyright message, which is this. And then... Then we get the DS, which is here. And the value goes like... That's not right. I believe that the this arithmetic operation is incorrect because all my labels may be being set correctly. Okay. Short drink break and I should be right back. Okay, let's have a go with this. I actually found a can of beer in the fridge. It is zero alcohol beer. I've been trying to find one of these that's actually drinkable. Hmm. It's kind of bland. Oh well. So, uh, where were we? I am pretty sure that uh, it's not setting symbols correctly. So that first symbol here is CCP start, 
which is a implicit symbol, sort of. So, uh, right. We need to call set implicit label even if there is no instruction. How does that work? Whoa, we've got something. 3783, 377F, those look like actual values to me. And yes, the range of addresses looks sane. All right. So we now need to start actually emitting something to the disk. Now, traditionally, CPM emits Intel hex record files. Uh, that's the, uh, let me reassemble the CCP with the real assembler. That's these. And you then use the loader with the load command to turn these into a binary. And I am not convinced this actually adds any value whatsoever. And I'm wondering about having the assembler just emit binary files directly. The advantage is it's much simpler code at my end. It's much faster on an old CPM machine with like a two or three kilobyte per second at most floppy disk drive, not including seek times. You sweat blood over every byte of I.O. And this is, you know, it's like about 100, about 250% the size of the actual thing. And it's not like these files are relocatable anyway. Uh, and they don't have any, have any symbol information. I mean, literally all you can do with them is to throw them at the loader and the loader assembles them in memory. And most people never actually use more than one. I'm not even sure the load command supports more than one. Let's have a quick look at the manual. Uh, it's the load command actually in the assembler. No, it's not. If you're actually going to do anything that involves multiple source files, you're going to use Mac, which does emit relocatable output files, and which I have no intention of rewriting because it's really complicated and has a complete macro language in it. So I think I just want to, instead of emitting hex files, I just want to emit like bin files. This means that you can do a one pass translation from a source assembler file to a actual runnable com file if you use a, an org of 0100 so let's do that I mean it's not entirely compatible with the real thing but if you can always turn a bin file back into a hex file if you want I can easily provide a tool that does that you need to remember what address it was at okay so emitting output. Now the same problems that applied with reading apply to writing as well. So we're actually going to need a couple of buffers because we can only write in 128 byte chunks. So And I also need a bin buffer. Once this is done, I need to see how much memory I've got left. Because if I, if I can increase the buffer size, I can get much better throughput. And we also need a buffer for the print file, which I haven't done anything with yet. I'll deal with that later. I probably won't deal with the print stuff in this session because 
I think I can actually make this work today, which will make a nice wrap up from the session and I can do the rest another time. Actually, yeah, let's just lose those. Where's my emit code? Yeah. So our program counter can change during assembly, but only forwards. So I will actually if so let me see. Oh yeah, we also need to to close our output file. Closing the output file flushes stuff from memory to disk. You don't need to close, re close input files. There are no resources allocated from the system in CPM when you open a file. That's why the FCB is a structure rather than it being like a file handle. Surprisingly elegant, actually. CPM, yeah. file CP. I assume that returns close file. I assume that returns FF on error. Yep. I don't know what error it would be actually. Yeah, some versions of CPM always return zero. Huh. Okay, uh, now our output bin is being flushed, so. We wish to Flush any pending data in the buffer. And we also need to remember what address the data in the bin buffer was destined for. Okay. Bin buffer right. Count equals zero. And buffer base equals zero. There are no bytes in the output buffer, and the base address is zero. It also occurs to me that, so the base address of the output bin file is going to be the first address of output in the source file. So if you have like org 3400, then you'll end up with a memory image intended to be loaded at 3400. This matches CPM executables. So we need to know whether we're waiting for the first byte to be emitted or we are uh, uh, or we are um, relocating 
the base address because the user's just done an org at a different but higher address and we need to omit zeros. So we're actually going to need a buffer fixed. Okay. So emit 16 is really simple. We're just going to emit uh, little endian values. So emit ATW SFF. Don't need to do that. The compiler will do it for me. Like so. Right, emit 8 is where the work actually happens. So if we are not fixed, then the buffer starts here. If the program counter is greater than is if the program counter is out of range of the buffer then we're going to need to flush the buffer. Hmm. Just thinking of whether we could, whether we need to write zeros, or whether we can try and do uh, seeking into the output file to write data at a specific location, which would actually be more efficient. going to do this the simple way. Uh, so while So these are the number of bytes that we need to add, number of zeros that we need to add to the output buffer. Buffer is full, then flush the buffer. Adjust the base address. Yeah. 
Okay. Right, that should do that. So when we emit a byte, we keep writing zeros until the program counter matches, and then we emit our byte. So in emit raw, we actually write the value to the buffer and flush the buffer if needed. So we now need to actually flush the buffer which we do with set TMA. And, oh yeah. I assume write sequential can fail. Values returned in AR, okay. Zero is okay. The CPM error codes are all kind of bit random. Sometimes FF is error, sometimes zero is success. Normally when FF is an error, then success can be zero, one, two, or three, and those values have specific meanings. So, error. error writing output file. And this will write a single 128 byte sector to the bin file. which we Okay, let's try that. Pixel Call write sequential. Yeah. Oh, I didn't put in a. Mm. I didn't put a system call in for that. No, I added the system call. I just didn't add the header for it. CPM write sequential. Yeah. Access element in array of, oh, that's stat. Uh, six. All right, now that one. already defined label errors now we didn't before doesn't like line 45 at max len I know why it's because emit 16 calls emit 8 twice and emit 8 advances the program counter uh, Yeah. Okay, well that did something. We have a 2K bin file. That looks promising. It's got stuff in it. It looks kind of right. Uh, well, uh, we have load there, so I actually need to now assemble the CCP with the old assembler, and then 
Uh, load it. What did that load to? I think that loaded it to ccp.com, which is not right. Okay, it did load it to ccp.com. So, yeah, the actual data starts at 3300. And yeah, I don't think this is, don't think that's right. Uh, so, there's probably a way to tell load the the correct address, but let's just do it like this. better. This is what it should look like. This is what it, what my assembler makes it look like. So does Vim have a hex mode? Help. then. Right, so what it should be is on the right and what I get is on the left. And it looks okay. Yeah, um, I can see that I seem to be inserting stuff Let's find the byte two. Wow, yes. Oh, of course, uh, this, this is because this is an address referring to further down the file. So any changes caused by inserting things is of course going to change the addresses. So doing a simple compare is not going to work here. However, I can see something wrong here. 5FOE02C3. 5FOE02OO-C3. I think I have an emit 16 where I should have an emit 8, and that's what's causing that. OEOO is... Where is my... Uh, I actually now want the other 8080 instruction set page, this one. OE is O E is MVI. MVI CD. Yep. Okay, so that's Still not right, but it's better. So I can tell it's not right because the bottom's wrong. However, 
it looks like this doesn't look too bad actually. So you've got add.com, blah blah blah, this all looks okay. It's the next line where things start going wrong. C38237. C3 is a jump. C38237, that's the right address, followed by some stuff. So I bet these are the jumps, and here we have a... yeah, okay. Ah, right, I know what's going on here. Uh, I am emitting zeros in a DS, and I bet that this assembler is emitting junk. Yeah. So I am emitting zeros up to here, and then we get data, 242424. Two, four, two, four. And so this is doing the same thing here. 202020. Two, 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 two. No, wait, this, this is the digital research. Yeah, this is the digital research assembler. So we get up to the 42 here, and then there's nothing but zeros, but I have stuff. That is the oh, interesting. Right, because that zero, which is I think, is sub followed by three zeros, so S U B zero zero zero. That zero corresponds to this zero here. And everything afterwards is DS. So in fact, what's happening is it's my assembler is getting up to this point and it's emitting the byte, then the DSs are not actually emitting anything, they're just adjusting the program counter. So what we're doing is we're writing what's left in the output buffer from the last sector and in fact that matches everything here. Right, that's an easy fix. Uh, several easy fixes. Now I could change DS to write zeros but I think instead... Is that what I want to do? Cause this will only apply to the last record. Because everywhere else, if you do a DS followed by data, my emit routine will insert zeros into the output stream. Yeah, this stuff. So it's only the last record that is causing any issue. Um. I know what I'm going to do. Rather than just call flush, uh, I am going to So if there's anything in the output buffer, if there's anything in the right and the output buffer, write zeros until the output buffer gets flushed. That wasn't quite what I wanted.
Okay, so let's take a look at this in the hex editor and we get some nice zeros at the bottom and we take a look at what Digital Researcher's Assembler said and it looks much the same. But I'm not going to take my word for it, so... And they're different. Byte 213. D5 Not one, two, three, four, five. Not one, two, three, four, five. That looks the same to me. Oh, that eleven is different. Intriguing. Why is that different? Is that an address? Is that just a dodgy opcode? What is... Well, 10 is a knob and 11 is an LXI and 3BCD looks like an address so I reckon I've got the wrong opcode for LXI Yeah, I have. Um. No, wait, hang on. Yeah, okay, the, the opcode value is not in the value field, so it's actually just a constant, and that constant is 01. Right, now let's try it. And compare. 318 line 2. Is that the same address? No, it's not. One three e Oh, I keep forgetting I can actually type decimal values in there. Good. Uh, 318. There we go. So CB versus CA. CA is, assuming this is the same problem, Oh, it's one of them. CA is comp D. No, it's not. It's JZ. So the J's are either in A or two. Yeah. Two A, two A, two A. Three, five, two. Hang on, is that, that, that's a bit further on. Three, five, two. Yeah, C2, 3, C3, so C2 is a C012, J, N, Z. Really? So what have we got here? We've got C3 here and C2 here. Uh, here.
Oh, getting better. 1948. That's okay. Right, this is where I am emitting zeros, but the DR assembler is emitting garbage. So I am not actually okay. So that is, in fact, the block looks like the last significant change. That means my assembler works. Whoa. Well, let's do a very quick and crude benchmark. So I'm a little bit faster, which is interesting. Faster than the hand tool assembler. Uh, I Hmm. There's still work to do. I haven't done any of the printer output yet. Their assembler is 8K. Mine is <laughs> smaller. But again, I haven't done the printer code. And I don't have any of the hex code in, which is, you know, so much simpler not to have. And I haven't tried this in real hardware at all. Um, SDCC does generate Z80 code where the uh, the digital research assembler is of course like intended to be assembled with itself which is an 8080 assembler so it's written in 8080 code uh, I've got a copy of the source here I just so it's been really useful for uh, reference Copyright 1978. And it's all modularized with bits that jump to other bits because it's designed to be written in multiple files with an assembler that doesn't support uh, relocation or linking. So what you do is you assemble it into discrete chunks. So you see this module starts at a fixed address and then you load it all together in memory. This is at 1100, yeah. So... Yeah, you can, you can see the gaps between modules. And this is the table it's using for the, uh, the opcodes. And they're, they're all glued together. It's got another table elsewhere with the lengths in them. But my assembler works differently. So here's a set of zero terminated strings. Okay, that's working. It's got like a ton of stuff to do, but that's actually successful. And this is all going to be BSD two clause licensed along with the rest of the stuff I've been doing on this. So there will be finally, after 41 years, be a proper open source, very, very simple assembler to distribute with a CPM-like operating system. Let me just commit that. Of course, it hasn't been properly tested or anything. All right, and push. Fantastic. So I will sign off and tomorrow I will go and edit all this footage together and find out how long I've been working on this bloody thing. It's probably a scary number. Well, hope you enjoyed watching. Please let me know what you think in the comments.